welcome to Job Development Authority for Monday, May 3rd. Um, welcome to Roll Call. Weigel. Here. Dockler. Here. Weber. Here. Mock. Here. Kwame. Here. Sandy. Here. Veen. Here. Mayor Baczynski. Here. Um, item 2, JDA action items. Um, 2.1, case loan request, ODRA. Uh, thank you, members of the authority. Um, Brandon Bombach, I'm Business Development Director at the EDC. To present the OJRA application in front of you, OJRA is an original equipment manufacturer for street sweepers with the corporate headquarters in Grand Forks, uh, North Dakota. These uh, road sweepers are used by municipalities and private contractors for road construction, maintenance, and repair internationally. Um, they have experienced a lot of growth over the past five years, and uh, they anticipate a continuation of this trend. So they're outgrowing their current location and are seeking to add on an additional 17,000 square feet to double their, their current production of capacity. Um, to support the expansion, the company is pursuing a pace uh, buy down on the lead lender's note. The total project is $1.45 million, company equity of 362,000. Um, the request is to buy the interest down from 5.6 on the first state bank note of just over a million dollars. That's a request of you for $148,000 that would leverage a bank in North Dakota portion of $276,000. Loan to value is right. We'd like to see that um, secured with um, mortgage on the property, corporate guarantees, and personal guarantees from both Merrick and Alex Bazinski. Um, just a note that there are there's currently two liabilities um, the growth fund is holding, totaling $65,000. These are requested to be moved into a second position behind the new dollars um, and behind the first state bank liabilities. Um, this is uh, common practice for the JDA. The EDC approved this on April 1st. The growth fund approved it on um, April 19th and they're recommending your consideration of the application. I am joined here by Mirik Bazinski, who is the president of the company, and Carla Uloa, who is the manager of the facility, and all three of us would be happy to answer any questions if you have them. Thank you, any questions? Mr. Weber? Uh, just a quick comment. Uh, congratulations on your business success, and uh, thanks for making Grand Forks your home for your, your headquarters here. Uh, yes? Very good. Uh, I'll, I'll move approval. Oh, can we do the public hearing? Uh, thanks, yeah. yes. Um, let's open the public hearing. Seeing none, Mr. Weber. I'll, I'll, I'll move approval, hearing. please. I'll second. And a motion by Weber, second by the mayor. Any further comments? All in favor, signify by saying <coughs> aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Item 2.2, C-Run Loan Request HB Sound and Light. Hello, Chair Mock, members of the authority. Uh, my name is Colin Hansen. I am uh, presenting a COVID C-Run uh, RLF loan from HB Sound and Light. Uh, HB Sound and Light is a production services company. They have three different portions to their company. The first is renting event-related equipment, such as lighting, staging, audio, and promoting events. They do the installation of audio, video, security, and streaming services at commercial and residential locations. And they also have a live stream and HB Studio production on-site uh, for event purposes. Uh, they have four JDA loans existing. Most are flex pace or pace buy downs and one existing C run loan. All of those are in deferral and in good standing. As far as COVID impact, uh, it's a pretty easy one to demonstrate with the cancellation of many events in 2020 and uh, a, a complete drop off in event sales. Uh, overall, they saw significant losses in 2020 and going into 2021, things are starting to recover uh, and this uh, request is gonna be part of that recovery for them. Um, as far as the recovery, they pivoted uh, really well to live streaming events, investing in cameras and equipment necessary to do that. They've created a studio in their Grand Forks and Fargo locations for people to host live events uh, or live streamed events. And this fund, these funds are going to be used to purchase a stage line mobile stage, which allows them to more effectively and efficiently host outdoor events, which they expect an increase of uh, going into 2021 to help mitigate the spread of COVID. Uh, this also allows for them to have more capacity for national acts and moderate sized crowds. Uh, they also use the funds to purchase speakers and amps for the stage, and this allows them to host multiple outdoor events at a time, uh, which is going to be crucial for the summer of recovery. Um, 
As far as the recommended loan terms, we are recommending approval of an equipment loan to purchase the mobile stage, as long, along with speakers and amps for that stage, uh, up to $150,000 in equipment loan at 1% interest, deferred for 12 months, uh, amortized over 84 months or seven years. Uh, at the request of the Growth Fund Committee, we are going to be uh, securing it with a purchase money security interest against the equipment itself, as well as a blanket lien against uh, company assets. A uh, personal guarantee will be required for this loan, and a turndown note has been obtained for it. And with that, uh, this was approved by the Growth Fund on April 19th, and I'll stand for any questions. Thank you. Any questions? Seeing none, let's open the public hearing. Seeing no one, we'll close the public hearing. Um, any further comments or questions? Motion by Mr. Sandy, second by Mr. Weber. I'll second with congratulations to you, Wilson. Good to see you, Jamie. Seeing no further comments, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries unanimously. Um, item 2.3, Accelerate Loan Program. Good evening, Chairwoman Mock, Mayor Baczynski, members of the authority. Pleasure to be here this evening to talk about an exciting program, Accelerate Loan Program, as a strategy to grow uh, tech companies in Grand Forks. We've talked a little bit about the past, that we have about a third of the typical concentration of technology companies and jobs in Grand Forks, and we think we can do better, and this is an exciting program. We think that we can help some take some steps in a positive direction. Uh, it's a program to provide high risk and high reward capital to promising early stage tech companies. Uh, the Growth Fund Committee reviewed this program on April 19th and recommended approval, and we're seeking your approval for the terms outlined in the staff report, and then staff would prepare a program description around that and move the program forward. As we mentioned, it's a uh, program to support tech companies uh, outlined, and Meredith Richards did a very nice job in the staff report lining, outlining the eligibility, eligibility of companies, and they are tech-related companies. Uh, this program is fashioned very much after the LIFT program, Legacy Innovation Technology Fund. Uh, at the state level, it does very much the same thing, and those terms are very similar. They're outlined in the staff report. I'm going to hit a couple of quick high ones. A maximum loan of $250,000, that's a local uh, sort of cap to try to spread this out a little bit. Five-year term, three years, no interest, no payments. Two years, 1% interest, a balloon payment then the five years to give the company a little bit of a runway to put these uh, funds to use. Um, uh, UCC filing on company assets, uh, it's a loan. We want it back if the companies are successful. And the loan must be matched dollar for dollar from outside investment. And one of the things that's not mentioned I want to highlight is there's no mention of a personal guarantee. And it's the intention of staff, and I think when we had the discussion at Growth Fund, to, to take a bet on the entrepreneurs and their idea and their technology, but not hamstrung, hamstring the companies with a personal guarantee to have this product be very attractive so that tech companies are attracted to this resource. Um, uh, the, uh, the goal would be to have 10% of the liquid assets of the JDA be, uh, be targeted for this fund, and initially uh, $1 million worth of funds available uh, in year one. A quick uh, slide presentation. I know we want to be moving, but just want to talk a little bit about uh, the process. Uh, we envision a couple of conversations with the Growth Fund Committee, and what's not on this slide presentation is the fact that the EDC will be reviewing these, the EDC board will be reviewing these, and we're going to do an enhanced level of due diligence. We won't have the bank as a partner in this case to do that. See at the Growth Fund, have a pitch deck. I'm going to run through that very quickly in a moment. Q&A. Uh, look for some feedback, maybe some follow-ups, bring them back later, and then ultimately make a recommendation to bring to the JDA if you are so inclined the Growth Fund Committee. Uh, in terms of the application, we're going to ask for really what the state asked for, from, for, for that requirement, so business plans, balance sheets, all of the things that you would expect to, uh, that we would ask for. And then in terms of a pitch deck, and we think this is extremely important, we'd like to give the companies that are uh, applying for this program a little bit of guidance in terms of what we're looking for. Uh, you can read, so I won't do that, but uh, I'm just going to run through it quick here. But these are the things that we think that we want to know that they've thought about. Um, and slide two. Uh, just more of that. So we think these are critical questions. Uh, the Growth Fund Committee will do some very difficult question asking around these subjects and likely ask for follow-up information and come back in a month or so and then, and then provide that feedback and then you would move it forward. Uh, the Growth Fund would, should they be so inclined to do so. 
I went through that very quickly. I know we've talked about it before. I'm happy to back up and provide some more information. But I, this evening, we're looking for approval for this program as outlined in the staff report. There are questions, comments? Well, I just, like I said, Chair, mm -hmm. Chair Wormach, please. Uh, I just want to thank Keith Lund for the, your work on this and Brandon Bombach as well. It's been many months uh, in the making. I think this program really sets Grand Forks apart as a leader in building tech and tech jobs. Uh, the local legislators have been uh, really happy to see this as a local match to help support the LIFT program and continue its viability. Um, so really exciting all around. So thank you for your work. Thank Paul. you, Mayor. I appreciate your vision and leadership as well. Thank you. And, and the authority. Well, let's open the public hearing. Seeing no one, let's close the public hearing. Any further comments or motions? Move Motion approval. by Weigel, second by Kavami. Any further comments? Seeing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, do we have a motion? I'll second that. And a second. All in favor. Aye. Welcome everybody. We're going to call to order the Grand Forks City Council meeting May 3rd, 2021. Uh, Candace, roll call please. Weigel. Here. Dockler. Here. Weber. Here. Mock. Here. Bami. Here. Sandy. Here. Veen. Here. All present. Thank you. Uh, 1.2, Pledge of Allegiance. President Sandy. If I may, Mayor, I'd like to uh, make a motion to suspend the agenda and move all public hearings and second readings of ordinance item three and item four action items to the uh, head of the agenda, please. Thank you, Mr. Sandy. We have a second. Second from Mr. Weber. So we're going to move uh, three and four items, three and four in full, uh, right after 1.2 and before 1.3. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Thank you. So we'll move on to three public hearings and second readings of ordinances. Public hearing and resolution of necessity and determination of protests for project number 8311, district 753, reconstruct Belmont Road. And number 8327, district 757, reconstruct 27th Avenue South. So let's start with 3.1A. We'll open the public hearing at 3.1A. Public hearing is closed. Oh, do we have a comment there? Any uh, further comments or motions on 3.1A? We've got a motion to approve from President Sandy, second from Mr. Kwame. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. 3.1A 3 carries unanimously. 3.1B. You already read that one there. You did. We'll open the public hearing for 3.1B. Seeing no one, public hearing is closed. Comments or motions? We have a motion from Mr. Wago for approval. We have a second from Mr. Cavani. All those, any further comments? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. 3.1B carries unanimously. Four action items. We do have to pull off 4.3 as it's an introduction to an ordinance. Other than, other than that, just 4.10, I was gonna pull. Anything else anybody wants to pull tonight? All right, so we'll move. Uh, <laughs> I better get them to the record first. Well, uh, will we hear about 4.11? Or does that need to be pulled, 4.11? Uh, yeah, do you wanna pull that one as well? Yes, please. Certainly no, can. no need. Very good, no need to pull that, thanks. Huh. All right, so we're going to go on the consent agenda for 4.1, 4.2, 4.4, 4.5, 4.6, 4.7, 4.8, 4.9, 4.11, 4.12, .4 .4 .4 .4 .4 and 4.13. Do I have a motion? Motion to approve from President Sandy. Second. I see nodding heads. Who wants the second there? We'll take a second from Mr. Weigel. Seeing no further comment, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. 
Those motions carry unanimously. 4.3. Application for class 8.1 craft field beer beer alcohol beverage license from Expedition League for use at craft field set license fee and introduce introduction of an ordinance to amend city code related to the class 8.1 craft field beer alcohol beverage license. Thank you. I think we had a good conversation at the call. Do we have a motion to uh, approve the introduction of the ordinance? I just or need for to be the asked if I can be recused or if I uh, I, would, I would seek uh, Mr. Gostad for the correct language. The, the, as I understand, you might have a conflict because of some marketing or something you're doing out the craft field. Area. Yeah, in the private sector, my employment is involved in the, this uh, enterprise, so I'd like to ask to be recused. So then I, I guess I'd be up to, is there a council member that would like to motion to recuse him? we got a motion from Mr. Weigel, second from Ms. Mock. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. All right, Mr. Kavami, you're recused. Got a motion to approve. Uh, for the application introduce, to introduce the ordinance, 4.3. Do we have a second? Second from Mr. Weber. Further comments? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. That introduction of ordinance approves, is approved. All right, 4.10. Department head classification matter. I think we had pretty robust uh, conversation on this one as well, um, and it was a close vote, so I think it's worth uh, bringing up again and having a vote. Um, I think I did a, a pretty fair job in, in um, giving examples in both hiring um, and at times uh, in any uh, mutual separations that as well of, of how beneficial contracted employees can be um, at the department head level. Um, certainly uh, only future department heads would be um, contracted, everything would stay the same as it currently is now. Um, I believe that is in the best interest of taxpayers. I personally come uh, from the private sector, um, and I think that's the best way to run the most efficient city. I tend to uh, want to run things very business-like and have a biz business mentality um, when it comes to running the city, and that is the, the tool that I need to, to do so. Um, so we brought that before council. I guess open it up to any further comment, or uh, we can definitely make a motion and, and move on, on item 4.10. Mayor Bachensky, I'll move approval. Got a motion to approve from Mr. Weigel. A second from Mr. Kavami. Any further comments? Seeing no further comments, um, Candace, if you wouldn't mind taking our roll call. Mr. Mayor, Mr. I would make a comment. Uh, I'm sorry. Mr. Sandy, please. Being late to the table. Um, uh, as I mentioned last week, um, I think that uh, contract employees are uh, a great value to our city. I think that uh, being having employees under contract provides uh, the right mechanism, in my opinion, for our uh, department heads, and I certainly support that motion. Thank you, Mr. Sandy. Any further comments? Now everybody wants to talk. Uh, uh, Vice President Mock, please. Um, I appreciate the discussion, and I actually appreciate the difference of thought. Um, I don't want to stand in anybody's way. I'm also worried about long-term consequences. So I've appreciated the discourse and um, no hard feelings either way. I just want to reach you on that. Yep, and I, I do know that a lot was made of political pressure um, and that there could be another council or another mayor in the future, but I think people do need to keep in mind those are elected uh, leaders and elected officials. So uh, they are the, the who the people are choosing to make those decisions. So I think... Uh, we have to keep that in mind when we worry about a future um, council or a future leadership that uh, that's who the people have chosen to, to be in those positions and it's not necessarily our job to, to try to police that. But, Mr. Weigel? I'll be brief, Mayor. Um, one thing I looked at with this whole thing is, is this may not affect any of us. We may not lose any department heads by the time that I get off the council or Mr. Weber, or Mr. Sandy, or, or even you, uh, Mayor Bachensky. So to me, it, uh, it makes sense. And then if a future council wants to go back and, and change uh, what we did or didn't do tonight, I think they have that opportunity. But I, I'll stand in support of it. Thank you, Mr. Weigel. Mr. Weber, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, during the co course of conversations, uh, thinking more deeply about this, this issue, as, as you've requested, um, it, it's become apparent to me that we do have a need for revisions in the current code. 
uh, possible changes in our hiring processes, uh, especially for department heads, and uh, possible need for reforms to our civil service system. system. And I think uh, many of those changes are consistent with, with your interests, but uh, I believe that that work needs to be done uh, beyond just the legal changes drafted by Mr. Gaustad. And so I've uh, sent a proposal to yourself and to Mr. Phelan about uh, how we could uh, continue this conversation. And uh, I hope that, that that will be considered in the future. Otherwise, I'm, I'm ready to vote now. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Weber. Any further hey. comments? Mr. Veen, please. This is, this is Ken. I, as you noticed, I was pretty quiet. I, uh, I thought all of my comments have been made in the past. I just didn't want to be repetitive of them. And I understand uh, your intent and don't disagree with that. I, I still have to say I continue to support the, the partner head classification system. Um, but I may be like Mr. Weber, which I have not talked to, would be willing to listen to something additional down the road. Thank you, Mr. Dean. Any further comment? Hearing none, we have a motion and a second on the floor. If you want, if you wouldn't mind, Candace, running the roll call. Weigel? Aye. Dockler? No. Weber? No. Mock? No. Kwame? Yes. Sandy? Yes. Bean? No. Motion is defeated three to four. Thank you. Oh, I believe that's all for action items. So now we're going to run this back. I think there's a few people that might have to take off. That's why we move this forward. I don't think we need a motion now, Mr. Goss, that we can just uh, continue as, as regularly scheduled. That's correct. Your motion uh, suspended it, and we now proceed where we left off. Mayor, but Mayor Bachensky, I also, just for the record, I think Mr. Veen was going to step out virtually too. So okay. I think we'll lose him. So we do have five five members left. I, I believe think. we have five member, members currently. And I don't we, believe we have any further action items. Uh, no, or any voted? They're all informational presentations okay. from here out. Sounds good. All right, we'll go to 1.3 mayor's announcements. Just wanted to, to highlight uh, spring cleanup. I think electric, electronics collection event on Saturday went great. Uh, Mr. Phelan even made it out there and got to see some of his dear friends. Um, and definitely a great service. I was out uh, all day with uh, the crews in spring cleanup week. Uh, really enjoyed myself uh, getting my hands dirty and getting to be out there with everybody and getting to see uh, you know firsthand the process. I wanted to give a special thank you to, to Brody Hutton and uh, Chad Bratvold as well. Um, they had me out there on their team. I think uh, they did some great work and we're working really hard. It was great to see. Um, we've got further uh, extended landfill hours this week as part of spring cleanup. So make sure Monday it's too late now, but uh, on Tuesday um, and, and the rest of the week on your normal garbage day, get uh, any, any junk you have out by seven to ensure that it gets picked up. I think that's a great service that the city provides and we wanna make sure we capture as much as we can. Um, with that, we are uh, in, in budget season, working uh, very hard and uh, excited to have the first presentation, hopefully uh, in June, to City Council. So more to come on that front. And that is all I've got uh, for Mayor's announcements today. So we'll move on to two awards, presentations, appointments, and proclamations. Proclamation Community Action Month. I got to visit... Uh, well, it was last week, Thursday or Friday, with the Red River Valley Community Action Group. We had a nice conversation. Lots of exciting things in the works, but uh, I'll make the proclamation for Community Action Month, May 2021. Whereas Red River Valley Community Action has made essential contributions to individuals and families by creating economic opportunities and strengthening communities, and whereas the Red River Valley Community Action is a robust state and local force connecting people to life-changing services and creating pathways to prosperity in Grand Forks, Nelson, Pemina, and Walsh counties in North Dakota, and whereas the Red River Valley Community Action is celebrating 45 years of innovation, impact, and proven results. Now, therefore, I, Mayor Brandon Bochensky of Grand Forks, North Dakota, do hereby proclaim May 2021 as Community Action Month in recognition of the hard work and dedication of the Red River Valley Community Action Group. So thank you for all that you do. Mental Health Month, May 2021, and Mental Health Matters Briefing Update. I'll do the proclamation first, and then we've got uh, some esteemed guests in a presentation. So. Proclamation Mental Health Month, May 2021.
whereas mental health is essential to everyone's overall health and well-being, and whereas all Americans experience diff times of difficulty and stress in their lives, and whereas there is a strong research that diet, exercise, sleep, and stress management can help all Americans protect their health and well-being, and whereas mental health conditions are real and prevalent in our nation, and whereas with effective treatment, those individuals with mental health conditions can recover and lead full, productive lives, and whereas the Mental Health Matters Community Collaborative in Grand Forks works to promote resilience, strength, and emotional well-being for people in the Grand Forks community through education and collaboration to increase awareness and access to mental health, mental health resources. Therefore, as Mayor of the City of Grand Forks, I do hereby proclaim May 2021 as Mental Health Month in the City of Grand Forks and call on its citizens to support initiatives related to mental health awareness and its importance to, the, to a healthy community. And we've got uh, Ashley, formerly Ashley Nelson. Congratulations, Ashley Cleveland. I believe I'm pronouncing that right. And Lieutenant Bill Mackey to present. So please, please step forward. Uh, Council members, uh, Mayor Bichensky, thank, thank you for your time tonight. Um, in a moment, I'll uh, have Ashley uh, give you a briefing on uh, where we're at with mental health matters. Um, but I want to discuss real briefly that um, her standing up here next to me is a uh, fortunate byproduct of uh, COVID-19. Initially, her position was uh, scheduled to start with the public health uh, department. Um, they've had their hands a little bit full over the last uh, 14 months. And when Mr. Phelan and Ms. Bovet were trying to find another uh, location to uh, start this uh, important uh, life altering uh, position, uh, they thought of the police department because we do have uh, officers that specialize in mental health and and trying to obtain mental health services for community members that are in need um, when the offer was made to us uh, we immediately saw the benefit of such a partnership and i must admit that uh, the first couple of months of her position have not disappointed me in fact they very much surprised me at how much traction she's been able to gain and uh benefit to the community uh, at this point i'll turn it over to uh miss cleveland thank you good evening mayor bochensky members of the council thank you for having me tonight <clears throat> so i am here to give a program update for mental health matters i um well i have a timeline in here so i'll <laughs> get to that okay thank you so um a lot of people are ask me what is mental health matters and as mayor bochensky um stated our mission statement but this really came as a community call to action after suicide deaths were quite alarming in 2018. So in 2019, the schools wanted to start a mental health collaborative in the community, and they um, sought assistance from the mayor's office. It began as a little bit of an offshoot as the call, from the call to action for opioid response. Um, so it was briefly named Call to Action 2.0, but we wanted to re name it to completely separate it because although mental health is going to include those behavioral health um, we don't ever want to take away from the original call to action for the opioid response so here we are with mental health matters um, I don't need to repeat the mission to you but um, as you read through it you can see that it is very broad and that is on purpose. We need this position to um, be able to evolve as needs evolve. COVID has certainly showed us that that is a most important aspect. Um, and hopefully through embodying this mission in the entire program, then our community will be an emotionally healthy place to live where people are gonna receive the support they need to thrive and succeed. So I put together a little bit of a timeline. As I mentioned, the 2019 was when the, the group really started coming together. So January 2019 was the first community meeting and it was very big. Um, and a lot of what happened in between then and March 2020 was getting the name, the mission and vision, uh, the hashtag GFCares, and establishing different work groups. So there was an education work group, data and policy, community awareness, and community collaborations and resources, each of which had a, a more direct mission and vision statement of their own. So 
at the, um, and I apologize, I forget if they were monthly or weekly, um, we were having quite a few meetings pre-COVID, um, and we would break up into our different subsets and be able to tackle things in smaller groups that were um, more manageable than having so many voices, but also being able to come together so that we were all going on the same mission. Then in March 2020, um, the website was created and there was a big kickoff event. Um, it was at one of the local pu public schools and it was well attended and it just hit the cutoff before everything shut down. So then as we are all very well aware, COVID-19 occurred and we really hit um, pretty much a pure halt. Um, it was really unfortunate because all of the partners that were involved, whether it was agencies or uh, community members with vested interest, we still knew that the work was important and maybe even more so because of COVID, but focuses had to be redirected and not a lot was able to happen with the program itself. So then in November of 2020, this position was granted through you guys, thank you. <laughs> and um, it was advertised and then I was hired in February and began in the end of February as the community mental health coordinator. So the first things I wanted to accomplish was updating the website as much as possible in a short amount of time, um, mainly because we did really pride ourselves on having a local agency directory. So since so many things had changed through COVID, getting that up to date was a top priority and I still am working on reaching out to actually speak to a representative from every single agency in the area and make sure that everything is accurate, figure out who has um, developed more telehealth services and anything else that they might be able to share with us. Um, some other things that we're able to learn through these phone calls is what a wait list looks like or what wait time looks like, which is really important information when somebody is looking for treatment somewhere. Um, we also picked up social media with Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can find them all at MH Matters GF. Um, and this is really to bring awareness to the program and all of the good work that the Grand Forks community is doing collaboratively. So I put this little spiel together. Um, I am located at the police department and I think a lot of people, actually I don't think, a lot of people asked who I was and what I did. So I kind of just wanted to put a little one page in my office and what I do is promote mental wellness by engaging community agencies, which is those phone calls that are happening right now, and also um, networking to make sure that uh, other partnerships are being um, are being formed to make sure that we're meeting goals. So what I do, or what that actually means, is I'm observing, studying, and researching mental health calls for service that are happening through the PD and other events um, that I will get to in another slide. But it's really been valuable being at the police department. Um, I joke because I thought I came in knowing so much more than I quickly realized. Um, and I am very grateful to Lieutenant Mackey and also Corporals Troy Vanyo and Justin O'Neill for really taking me in right away and making me a part of the team so that I can help understand what the needs are and oppor find opportunities for different resources we may be able to bring to our community. So, so far, some events that I have attended are Tea with a Cop at, at Alamein. Um, I did a, I was a guest speaker for a business orientation of over 100 employees where they requested a presentation on mental health and suicide prevention, also as it relates to substance use and discussed resources available. I attended a pop-up event at the University, uh, sorry, University School of Medicine and Health Sciences. This was in support of the Out of the Darkness Campus Walk, which is through the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. And um, the NFI group in Grand Forks was generous enough to allow me to attend their meeting last week and introduce myself, where I have already been able to make more connections with more 
um, communities in the area. So we'll, I'm really working to collaborate, collaborate with many groups to achieve local diversity and equity. So some future events that are coming up, um, really hitting a, a social media hard with a big campaign for Mental Health Month. So if you would like to go check it out, there are little tips and tricks every day um, and opportunities to share how you um, personally, excuse me, personally can um, relate to different um, coping mechanisms and ways to get through different, um, different circumstances. On this coming Thursday, there is a walk-in vaccination event for which I will be there, hopefully letting people um, kind of talk about what they're excited for. Um, we know that we've had really great vaccine confidence so far, but the sometimes there's a disconnect between the vaccine and what that what those social implications are going to be and those so, social implications are so deeply integrated into our mental health and some of those are more seen than others um, so I'm excited to be able to promote mental health in um, also with the COVID vaccine efforts. On May 26th, we'll have a drive-through mental health event in partnership with Prairie St. John's from Fargo. Um, those details are still being worked out. And then in November, I will present to the Chamber Leadership Program and have more updates and how I can um, hopefully help more businesses in the area. So other projects that I've been working on is the One Mind campaign with the police department. This is a campaign that the department has pledged to, to really increase their cultural awareness of around mental illness. Um, this will, um, this will, sorry, I just lost my word. <laughs> Um, this will ensure that 100% of police officers are all put through some sort of um, eight-hour equivalent mental health first aid course. Um, this proved to be a little bit more difficult, but I was able to work with officers in the office to find a replacement program for which the training sergeant will be able to get all of our officers through. So that was a big win. Um, I have also been able to go on follow-up visits and be included in team discussions regarding different resources and situations that are happening, whether that is from a crisis call or other partnering agencies that just need to brainstorm among other um, among other people because <laughs> it's just some situations are so complex that you want to get more people talking in the same space to be able to find um, find results. Um, looking forward to additional um, events. Events. There is an event calendar on the website as well, and it also includes the local support groups. And I have been helping with a. Um, research for employee assistance programs, which hopefully um, I'll be able to learn a little bit more on how I can help other um, organizations or businesses in the area make sure that they have the best EAP for their employees and what impl uh, implementing a new program would look like. Interactive screening programs would be the same thing, kind of starting here with the city and then working out to other businesses. This is going to be an online tool that allows people to anonymously kind of just do a little mental health check on themselves and then it's curated to whatever business or profession this is implemented in and it will guide you directly to the local resources um, that are available for whatever may be identified in those surveys. So for the future, I um, am hopeful to get a resource guide out by the end of the year. Um, mental health first aid and other presentations will be offered and those can be requested through the website or through social media. Um, I'm really eager to explore recruitment and retention options of mental health providers. And with that, 
um, the 988 implementation in July of 2022 is going to be a big undertaking um, and making sure that we have all of the teams in place to make sure that that's a smooth transition and is used as it's meant to be used. And like I mentioned, um, anything that the community requests, suggestions, or events that can be brought to my attention either through the website or the emails. Um, really, again, this is a community collaboration, so I'm just extending myself to anybody who wants to start a conversation. And that is what I have for the update tonight, so I'd be happy to stand for any questions. Well, Ms. Cleveland, I just want to say thank you for everything that you're doing. Um, mental health is always important, but I, I can't think of anything, uh, any time that's more paramount than the next three to five years coming out of this pandemic. And just thank you for being the, the conduit to bring all the groups together, um, going over to the police department, helping out there. Um, I just can't be more grateful for the work that you're doing and certainly ha happy to support uh, Mental Health Matters and you. So thank you. Thank you. Mr. Weber. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. You got that gleam in your eye. <laughs> uh, a, a question and comments for both Ms. Cleveland and, and Lieutenant Mackey. Um, first of all, Ms. Cleveland, um, uh, I had imagined that you have already made a tremendous difference in a number of people's lives. Uh, I, I don't want to be overly dramatic, but you've probably already saved lives in the Thank work you. that you've done. Um, and uh, and th this is this is terribly important work, obviously. Um, but uh, sometimes, especially around budget time, we look at uh, efforts like this and try to weigh you know, the, the dollars and cents of these matters. Um, and uh, while well, I, I, I think that it should be enough that we're helping people, we also have fiscal responsibility. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is Perhaps more a question for Lieutenant Mackey, but either of you uh, take this. Um, I suspect that in addition to helping people's lives, Lieutenant Mackey, that this is already saving uh, human resources and time at the police department. And that uh, there's actually a, a, a very real, though probably difficult to measure, return on investment from efforts like this. Is, is that your sense? Yeah, I think that's very fair to uh, say. Um, and that's just at the very beginning stages of this uh, project. Um, Ms. Cleveland's been able to uh, guide officers in the right directions. And our mental health officers have been doing this for a couple of years. And they've got great connections, but they do still occasionally run into a wall that they just can't get around. And Ms. Cleveland's been able to uh, move that wall on occasion and help. So yeah, the efficiencies that we're seeing just in the very beginning stages of this program um, are very impressive to me. Uh, as she makes more contacts um, and some of the resources she was discussing uh, for community members, um, I could potentially see our officers maybe not being quite as busy because community members are going to be able to access some of the information they need directly from the information that uh, she has on her website. And perhaps a savvy uh, community member could do that now, researching on their own. But when a person's in that stage of crisis, um, internet search is probably not the highest uh, priority. So having a one-stop shop like uh, Ms. Cleveland's creating uh, is going to be uh, undoubtedly beneficial to the community members. As you say, uh, perhaps we're not going to be able to put a value on that, but uh, I have no doubt that it's uh, going to be beneficial. And what I've seen so far, um, it, it's very exciting to, to see where this program could potentially go in the future. Fantastic. And a quick follow-up on that. Uh, I commend uh, Chief Nelson and, and Mayor Bachensky for supporting uh, the training that officers are going through. You're talking about 100% uh, training, um, and that, that's wonderful. Um, but of course, eight hours training, or even uh, some of the community mental health officers who are engaging in 20-hour workshops, uh, that's a small fraction of the hundreds of hours behind your degree, the expertise, the professionalism the professional expertise that, that you bring to this job. So, uh, Mayor, thanks for your support of this, and I, I, I hope that we will continue to support this when we uh, go through budget time as well. Thank you, Ms. Cleveland, and congratulations to you. Thank you. Thank you. Any uh, from Council, any other further comments or questions? Mayor, if I could say one thing. Uh, number one, Ashley was the real number one candidate, probably the real only one, so um, 
not only were we excited, but our partners, and you know, that's Grand Forks Public Schools, all true, uh, UND and others, and so they were all really excited that she's gonna help be that community coordinator, and she's gotten everybody, because it's this is beyond, uh, beyond us, and, and that was asked for us to be this coordinating force on behalf of the community. And I wanna thank um, Mayor Yu and the City Council, and I'm, I, I recall um, Council Member Kavami, you forward on, we should use some of our COVID monies for mental health matters, and so this is coming from your initiative, so it tells you uh, initiatives that the mayor and you as city council come up with, um, we try to execute as well as possible. And we are fortunate to have Ashley in our public health department that could uh, quickly shift over to the police department and in a new role. And I think this is the role that really um, fires her up and it's really in her sweet spot of what she really wants to do. So we're quite fortunate uh, to have you in. And it's just another example of you as policymakers suggesting something and then suddenly Ashley's here doing it. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Phelan. Well, as you energize us, hopefully we can give you a little energy back. So, Ms. Ms. Cleveland and uh, Lieutenant Mackey, thank you for your presentation. Mayor, I'll just, can I add one? Oh, Mr. Wilder, uh, please. I know Lieutenant Mackey talked a little bit about the One Mind campaign and, and uh, or even an equivalent to it. I think that's important. If you look at um, where the One Mind campaign came from, which is the International Association of Chiefs of Police, if you go on their website, there's only three agencies in North Dakota that have committed to this. There's one in South Dakota and five in Minnesota. Um, so I think it says a lot about the law enforcement agencies in North Dakota that, are, that have taken this pledge. Um, and, and I think they realize how important mental health is, both in the community and throughout the state. So hopefully more agencies will jump on board, but glad to see that the Grand Forks PD has. Thank you, and I brought stickers, so I'll let Todd hand those up. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. Update on the wastewater master planning briefing. Mr. Phelan. Thank you, Mayor Bachanski and members of City Council. Quite not quite as exciting, but uh, just as important. So it feels like we're getting um, past COVID, so we're getting back to regular briefing. So if you weren't here. Um, for a long time before we used to do this on a regular basis. So I think we're getting back to normal. So tonight I'm just going to give a quick overview and I, I, I can only do an overview because I can't do a deep dive on any of these slides. So um, be aware of that. So next week at the community hall, we intend to bring this facility master plan with, um, with people that have more knowledge on the in-depth part of that, but we thought we'd give you a quick survey. I'm also joined by Mr. Gaddy from AE2S who's um, helped support this plan and also with Melanie Parvey and Lisa Botnin from our waterworks department. So um, you'll hear more about it on, on Monday and then hopefully city council the following week and then eventually this plan goes to uh, the North Dakota Department of Environmental um, Quality. Um, Mr. Sandy, before the meeting, he mentioned that uh, as we move forward as an, another aside, that uh, we'll probably look at the second uh, call meeting of the month, which is the fourth Monday, that we would mo look to go to more deep dive on some items. So I think items like this, we'd, we'd probably wait for those to be the whole meeting so we take deeper dives on that. But for tonight, I'll give you a quick overview. Uh, I'm going to give you a quick, quick survey of uh, all these facility meet plan drivers and you'll hear more about on, on those further on next week, Monday. And I just want to let you know, you know, we, we talk a lot about jobs development authority and, and economic development. Um, the real story and the real truth is without Grand Forks having um, robust utility, utilities in our community, a lot of these projects wouldn't happen. It wouldn't matter what kind of tax incentives, what kind of salesmanship that we have. Uh, without these facilities, uh, things aren't going to happen. And that's highlighted really by Red River Bio Refinery, not only as part of their startup, but all the ups and downs that we've had. It tells you wastewater treatment plants um, are one of the prime economic development drivers we have in our, in our community. We should uh, never forget that. Um, I just want to give you the overhead um, of this. You can see our, where our small imprint of our wastewater treatment plant is compared to these 1,300 um, acres of, of lagoons in our area. So it tells you when we did develop what a mechanical treatment plan does to, to treatment capacity. This facility plan, the one first thing we wanted to do is we want to send a report to the uh, North Dakota Department of Environmental Quality to try to rate our facility 
uh, as much as we can from a capacity perspective from both hydraulic capacity and also loading capacity. So that's what we're going to do, number one, you're going to hear next week, and I'm going to show you some numbers. We're going to try to re-rate our existing facility and have as much capacity as possible until, before we look at what we need to do for uh, additional capacities. Again, this is a footprint of our, our wastewater treatment plant, and you can see what we're serving for people. And, and, and um, remember that we're serving um, East Grand Forks too, so that's where we add on to our Grand Forks population. To others, we have 10 significant permit users, highlighted by mostly by J.R. Simplot and Red River, Red River Bio Refiner, our two largest. You can see what our average daily flow is, 8.6. Right now, we're rated at about 10 million gallons per day. And you can see what we can load our facility from um, a, a loading perspective. So wastewater treatment plants are probably more complex in many ways than water treatment plants and the fact that you have to uh, treat this high strength that's coming through. So um, it's a little bit of a different animal than our water treatment facility. Um, this is our, the facility timeline. So. Uh, it started in 1995, and, and um, probably fortunate for you, after the flood, this, this facility was started. And um, one of the things we learned um, as part of this facility master plan back in the early 90s, I came here as public works director in 2000, so I had the opportunity to try to get this um, facility up and going. It was a bit of a challenge. So uh, we learned a lot about doing a lot of due diligence uh, at treatment facilities like that, so as we move forward, they're, they're easier to start up. You can see where we started up in 2003. Uh, we did some additional studies. In 2006, we resolved some um, litigation that we had regarding this plant, and then we moved forward um, um, throughout the, the decade. Um, even though we had challenges with this particular treatment plant, one of the highlights uh, of the second half of this decade in 2010 and beyond, it really showed is that we got the plant up and going and it allowed us to work with our industry as they change. So one big highlight is in 2013, um, we should be very grateful that um, J.R. Simplot chose to reinvest in their facility in the late 2000s and early 2010s. They were kind of at a fork in the road of what they were going to do. They decided to move forward and invest um, probably tens of millions and probably up to 100 million into their existing facility. That was a big win for the for the community of Grand Forks in, in that time period. One of the things they did along the line is they had an aerobic pretreatment system and they ch decided to change it to an anaero anaerobic system or without air. And so the big deal as part of our treatment plan is that we could allow them to shift to a different pretreatment system from a wastewater perspective and we could modify our treatment plan to, to sustain their wastewater flow. That was a big deal to how we were able to adapt to different industries as we move along the way. The other one was 2017 with um, the East Grand Forks Interconnect was a big deal that we could handle them both hydraulically. Um, East Grand Forks does not have American Crystal Sugar integrated into their wastewater system. So they have a separate discharge permit um, with them, which is, which is good. So the wastewater that we receive through East Grand Forks does not include the um, American Crystal Sugar industrial loading, and they have a separate permit on that. And then lastly, um, or the two last things is that we, we came to you in the late teens and early 20s, and we moved forward with a direct discharge system. So before 2020, we were discharging through our lagoons, and so what we asked for is we needed some alternative backup so that if we, we used our lagoons as kind of the final treatment process, that so we would have an alternative strategy where we could treat. So in 2020, we, we started up a direct discharge. So in other words, we can go from our mechanical treatment plant through disinfection, through a pipe into our discharge so we don't have to go through the lagoons. It provided us an alternative strategy to discharge our, our wastewater treatment. And then finally, um, we had Red River Biorefiner in, and that's been well told that um, that was another significant uh, user that we added on from an industrial perspective. It wasn't quite what we thought we, we were going to get at the start, but again, our treatment plan had the available capacity and we could adapt with them even during times of COVID and, and emergency. So I won't go through this, but when we come back, we're going to notate all the deficiencies and challenges. That's what this facility plan is going to call for, and to include all the notes right here. Um, I just want to highlight um, we have a, I have a lab, and I think the, the point of this photo is to show because we have such significant industry in our community. And so a lot of cities, if you were in a suburban area, uh, you would have domestic strength of wastewater. It'd be pretty straightforward, but you should know that probably half of our capacity and most of our strengths comes from industry, meaning that we have to be really adaptive 
and we have to change quickly because um, they do different things to us. So you can see, if you look on this day in July, the different streams we're getting through our wastewater treatment plant. So you can see at some point, some of it looks real domestic because it's, you know, it's yellowish. And there's some of this oranges where obviously industry is discharging and our wastewater treatment plant has to adapt to the different flows that are coming our way. Our current plant with these uh, four bioreactors don't work in a one-to-one. -one. They kind of work in more of an artistic fashion. Um, and that's what's meant for these squiggling lines. They kind of work in, in a different way and not in a one-to-one -one relationship. And so when we go to what we're planning for as we move forward, the other thing about these bioreactors that we have, they basically have air diffusers on, on the bottom. So they're blowing air into the system um, as we move forward. So what we're proposing, um, I'll get to the, I, I, before I get to that. So we looked at what, what capacities do we have. So the intent of this is to look at our current capacities is what we're gonna say, we have capacities current, we're gonna to try to update our capacities for the existing mechanical wastewater treatment plant and to include our lagoons, which are part of our wastewater treatment plant system. We are still, as you saw that, um, the, of those 1,300 acres, we are going to try to close the westernmost lagoons, or about a third of our lagoons over this next planning horizon and still maintain um, about two thirds of our lagoons. But you, if you can see this, this um, basically demonstrates that we have, we have capacity on, on the hydraulic, the flow side, but we're reaching capacity on our strength parameters. And so we, we do have some, some red lines and some yellow lines that we're, we're at or near where our capacities are. And a lot of that was driven by Red River Biorefinery, um, some due to East Grand Forks. East Grand Forks is more of a flow perspective. And so we're at the point of having to upgrade um, how we can treat, not from mainly from a hydraulic capacity perspective, but more from a strength and loading capacity um, as we move forward. Along the way, we're gonna, um, as I noted, as part of this design uh, that started in the late 90s, there's some things that we need to get corrected in the facility as we move forward. So these are just some visuals of that. And we're looking at kind of where we're going. So what the team has done, both the consultant and the city staff team, um, all the way down to our wastewater folks, they're gonna, we're gonna look at specifically alternative number two, which is this um, bioreactor um, facility. And so um, that's gonna be the number one. The, they did a scoring analysis, and as part of that scoring analysis, the, the higher the number, um, the better the, the alternative is. So you can see alternative number two is the number one um, based upon opinions, costs, and operation and maintenance. So similar to what we always try to do, we're, gonna, we're going to renew those reactors, but we're gonna do dif different things in those four reactors. And so it's going to be infrastructure that we're gonna reuse, um, but we're gonna reuse and we're gonna kind of um, renew those uh, insides of those um, particular reactors as we move forward. So inside those reactors, instead of having air diffusers on the bottom of them, they're gonna have concentric circles with different kind of treatment capacities uh, as we move forward. So I think it's a great reuse of these reactors, but using them in a different way with a different technology that will allow us to treat the wastewater in even a better and more efficient um, fashion as we move forward. Again, we're gonna have four phases um, as we move forward. So I think um, if you were here in the 90s and 2000s, we went through this whole facilities master plan. We, we did a lot of work. And now we've, done a whole gener we've had a generation of a wastewater treatment plan, and now we're so fortunate to now go through the, uh, another generation of how, to, how are we gonna renew this facility. And that's really where we're at with these next phases over this current decade. And uh, these numbers um, are a little scary when you look at them at first. So you can see what we're proposing, and, and this will be a further discussion with you guys next weekend throughout the budget process, is that we're proposing some reinvestments in our wastewater treatment facility from 13.7 million over the next few years, and then more broadly, 31 million um, over the next several years. And then you can see in yellow and blue are some things that we may have to do in the future. Now we have been planning, the, the gray um, line in below is that we have been incorporating this into our rate analysis planning. We've been including in, to, into our CIP. So you can see we've included 31.2 million over this, a similar time frame, knowing that we were gonna be at the um, end of our phase of, of this existence of this wastewater treatment plant, we're gonna do, have to do some renewal. So just so you know, um, this year, about uh, $30 million of debt service will be paid off of our current wastewater treatment facility. 
And then I think by um, 2025, 26, the remaining $8 million will come off. So about $38 million over the next um, few years to several years will be all paid off based upon the, the, what we all did in the 90s and in the 2000s as we move forward. With that, it's, it's not going to have a significant impact. We are going to propose some rate impacts over the next six to 10 years that are going to be more in the cost of living increases. So probably more in that 3% range is what we're going to be anticipating as we move forward um, over the next six years as we look at this time horizon. And again, this is what we, we, we talked about. And so we want to eventually want to get the Department of Environmental Quality to uh, approve the plan. We want to get them to look at helping us fund the plan. And I think with the new upcoming federal stimulus and, and state funds, we want to be eligible for some state grants and federal grants regarding updating our facility. And one of the first steps you got to do is get your plan approved by the um, state of North Dakota. So with that, um, we'll go into a deeper dive on Monday, and then you'll see this show up on the budget process. And this is kind of an overview of kind of where we're going. And I can't emphasize enough, this is probably one of the most important uh, economic development tools. We are looking with other agribusiness opportunities in our region, and the wastewater treatment plant is probably um, in the 1A, B, or C of what these companies want to see, of what kind of capacity you have, what it's going to cost, um, can you upgrade the facility while we develop our facilities. This is one of the main talking points that we have for the uh, city of Grand Forks. So with that, Mayor, that's kind of an overview, and if anyone has specific questions. More to come next week, Monday. Mr. Weber, too. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Mr. Phelan. And I can attest to the, the wastewater uh, capacity that uh, lots of businesses have been coming into town. And our infrastructure is, all, is a big part of what sells our, our city and some of these big employers uh, looking at Grand Forks, looking at the community. Um, any questions for Mr. Phelan on this, or you want to wait and hear more? Oh. You got something, Mr. Weber, if please? I may, Mr. Mayor, yes, please. Um, OK, it was very technical, Todd. You gave a great presentation. And if I were to take a test on it right now, I don't think I'd do really well. But that's my fault, not, not yours. Um, so we have an expensive project that we're facing, um, largely because of aging infrastructure, increasingly complex water that we're having to treat, and growing industry. How did I do so far? You did. And, and probably aging infrastructure. I think you got Aging infrastructure. Yeah. I think I said that, too. Um, Maybe I said it in my own mind, I don't know. Um, and this is going to be about a $30 million project to bring us up to where we need to be. And you're pitching it as, a, as an economic development project for us to continue to attract the kind of industry that we have. We, we must have this. Who, who will be paying this $30 million price tag, and how long will that be paid for? Is this a... A 30-year bond, uh, what, what does that look like? Yeah, Mayor Bertensky and uh, Councilmember Weber. Generally, um, the last time we built the wastewater treatment plant, we chose a 20-year um, state revolving loan, find a clean water SRF, if you will. Um, with the water treatment plant, the most recent water treatment plant, not to mix up the two, but we chose, a, in that case, a 30-year um, state revolving loan fund from the drinking water program. On this one, we'll have to determine whether this should be a 20-year or a 30-year. Probably makes more sense being in 20-year. And a 20-year note uh, through that program is 2% uh, generally. Um, so I think we'll have to do that. We're also going to look at grants, you know, whether it's state or whether it's this upcoming stimulus, infrastructure stimulus plan. Um, the federal government's going to fund three things on broadband, water, wastewater, transportation. Those are going to be the main functions I, I could anticipate, along with other, the other things they're calling infrastructure. But those would be the four main things. And as we provided that earmark briefing, the wastewater treatment plant was one of our things. So how are we going to pay for it? This is a great facility because everyone enjoys it. So everyone will pay their fair share. So we have customer classes of residential, commercial, and industrial. And we do cost of service um, rate impact analysis. And so all three of those categories will pay their fair share for this. Um, the one thing we always have to determine, who pays for, if there's future capacity? We're, who has to pay future capacity? Generally, when we have uh, additional capacity, we've put that on to the residential as from an economic development perspective. That's how we've looked at additional capacity. We'll have to see what kind of additional capacity we build into this and who pays for that uh, amount. Yet to come. 
Thanks, thanks. That, that was helpful. I, I, I normally don't like having these conversations while the cameras are rolling because I, I embarrass myself and I don't want to embarrass others either. Um, but we're going to put this on our, resi on, on our, our residential con consumers, um, an economic development project. And, and in, in many of them, uh, this is part of aging infrastructure. It's inevitable. We have to treat our wastewater. But our population hasn't increased that much. It's really the increase in industry that's driving a lot of this need. Um, shouldn't we be balancing some of that on industry? And I realize we don't want to charge them because then we scare them away and we don't have the economic development that we're hoping for. But there's putting it all on the backs of the residential consumers seems. No, Mayor Pachensky and Thanks. Um, Council Member Weber. Um, Everyone pays their fair share, no matter what. So we shouldn't think, because I call this an important economic development engine, doesn't mean they don't pay for it. So I'll give you examples. Red River Biory Farming pays their fair share. Simplot pays their fair share. You and I, as residential users, pay our fair share, and along with commercial entities, whether that's a, uh, a restaurant, a bar, or whatever else. We have, we have three customer classes. We look at where the costs are derived. In similar fashion, when we look at these improvements, we'll derive the same thing. We'll look at why um, is this investment having to occur, um, who should um, we parcel out the cost to, and then how do we impact that with rates? How do we proportion that? We do that every year, and with new improvements like this, we're gonna do the same thing. Um, the point is, the citizens of Grand Forks need a wastewater treatment plant, just like industry does, and we'll proportion all those out into their rates. But we'd also hope that the, the uh the, the charges that we've been, that the residential consumers have been paying all along, that there would have been some maintenance and anticipated uh, future needs in this. Let me, let, let me, I haven't asked a decent question. Let me ask, let me ask a more direct question. If my household uses 6,000 gallons a month, kind of an average for, for a household, and my current bill is, I don't know, what, $60, $70 a month, what's going to happen to my bill when, when we start paying for this? Sure. You or yourself or Mr. Gaddy, can you, can you tell me that? Yeah, Mayor Bachensky and Council Member Weber. So the reason why we debt service, certainly we've been maintaining this over the next, over the last 20 years, but what I'm talking about now is capital maintenance. And it's gonna move forward with the life of this facility for the next 20 years. And so we're gonna debt service that. So we haven't accumulated 20, um, $30 million in cash to pay for, because the theory we have is that we debt service. So people that enjoy um, the use of this facility will pay for it for the next 20 years. Just like those that have paid, we've all paid for the last 20 years as we move forward. With your rates, I would say generally people on your utility bill, if you have an $80 utility bill in Grand Forks, probably about 30 to 35 of that is wastewater related, whether it's your base fee and your flow fee. And what we're proposing over the next 10 years is that fee may go up um, 3% each year. That's what you're going to see. So take your um, thirty dollars, multiply it by three, and you would anticipate over the next ten years that's going to go up three percent. So when I say cost of living increases, that's what we anticipate for users like you. Um, I've been hearing a lot from the state and the feds about uh, infrastructure money and a lot of water money, and I thought, oh, we've we've already built our water treatment facility, but we, now we have another water project, and so you're going to be going after all of that. Every, every state and federal possibility to help offset this cost to the consumers as well, right? Yep. yep. I think um, um, people say, when is it ever going to be over? If you're a growing, <laughs> dynamic city, bringing in industry, yeah. it'll never be over. Uh, you'll never be improving. It's just uh, the way of life. And we just want to do it smartly so that we don't impact people really large in one year. And I think we got a plan to do that and try to phase some of these projects over time also. Thanks, Thanks for entertaining my questions. Any further questions or comments from Council? All right. And, and they'll be back, Mayor. There'll, there'll be a group that will be able to have, provide more in-depth answers. Yeah, if Mr. Guy is going to come and sit here the whole time, we're going to have to get yeah. him up on the, uh, on the, there to speak, so. Thank you. Residential recycling service briefing update. Mr. Fion, looks like you got three in a row, so here's number two for you. Good, thank you. Um, this one is, uh, well, 
This one is really always has engaged the city council. It's engaged um, the citizens of Grand Forks. So I'm going to talk about recycling now, okay? I want to introduce also, um, I want to thank Lisa Botton, and she's been helping out, um, you know, Lee Ray Leck, but she's been helping out over the last several years on the environmental side, not only in water, but also in land, in the landfill and sanitation, which is a big deal. Also want to introduce um, Greta Selesky is back there as part of our city administration is going to help out on this project, Spencer Halverson from the city administration. And I want to introduce an intern that's next to Greta, uh, Grayson Cole from Park River, North Dakota. She's going to be a city intern, and uh, she's in environmental uh, studies at UND. So she's going to move forward with that. So um, her advisor is Swazik Logat. Hopefully I said that right, Mr. K. So, Anyways, it's going to be our team approach is the whole point of this. And I want to introduce a couple. Uh, you, uh, we work with Burns McDonald a lot on our landfill um, type projects. And they're here um, by chance today, so I wanted to introduce them. So it's Scott Martin on the right and Bob Craig's on the left. And they've been part of our landfill along with some local consultants, CPS and WFW. So that's kind of works up the integrated management team. So I want to give you an update, get some feedback about kind of where we're going on, on the recycling um, end of this. Again, similar, if you go west of town, you'll see we have a lot of valuable, important facilities in our community. So I mentioned this uh, wastewater treatment plant here with the lagoons, and then we have an outfall that comes out here to the river. Okay, that's an important thing for Grand Forks. We have an inert landfill, which is our construction demolition landfill, which is um, right here in this area, right here. Mayor, you are probably out there today dropping some stuff off. This is our closed landfill right here, and we closed this in 2007. Um, because they built an east-west runway for UND Aerospace down here, so we closed closed this sol solid waste landfill. We moved the landfill right up here, so we're outside of the two-mile area. We're within five miles, so a lot of work went on that in the 2000s in a similar vein to the wastewater treatment plant. We were busy in public works doing lots, lots of different things. This landfill right up here, I, I want to I note, and sometimes we talk about this landfill is a 90-year asset. So imagine what, what happened in 2000 when we could say we built something and, and uh, designed and permitted it that's going to last for 90 years. And that's what we did in the 2000s. So these are, this cell, it keeps getting built on this section of land. And it, it's got about a 90 years capacity. Uh, we are, um, we talked about landfill closure and stuff. This area right here is filled. We're filling this area right here. And we talked about. Um, Burns McDonald were here previously going forward with another cell design. So this is a cell we're going to design. We're going to bid this year for probably construction next year. So you can see all the capacity we have left out there from a solid waste um, perspective. Um, two, one project we worked on, uh, Leary was here before, and we talked about this automated landfill scale. And so here's a photo of the, the automated landfill. So it's, uh, it's up and going. It's unmanned, um, it's, and so it's working. I hope it was working today, Mayor. And so a lot of trucks going through there today. A lot of trucks. So well. it, it's yeah. automated. Uh, used to have a scale house with a with a um, one of our humans out there working it. So now it's all automated, and so it's a really kind of a move forward for us. And so we're excited about that. Here's our solid waste landfill. So that section of land that I talked about, and here's here's that one large cell that I spoke of, right? And sometimes you hear, um, I listen to the mayor sometimes on the radio, and they say there's, there's stuff blowing all over the place out there, right? So here's our, here's our solid waste landfill, okay? And so it's pretty well kept and, uh, as we move forward. So one of the areas that we're, we're really working on at this landfill, uh, we're working with the North Dakota Department of Environmental Quality and others, is we wanted to look to see how we, we've done great things with bird activity both at the lagoons, our wastewater treatment plant, at our landfill, and that's where we bought up a, we used to have 20 gull strikes, now we're down to one or something like that. So as part of that, we're kind of up with a new strategy. And so as part of this landfill strategy, we've been doing, we haven't been bailing per se. Um, we bailed for about 20 years, and so we are asking that we could go to a, another way that would uh, control the litter and provide better bird mitigation. So that's what we've been doing. That's why we've hired USDA. That's why we've put up some different operational, just because it's better for um, the operators that are working out there. Bailing was really hard. It was mechanical, and we had some 
issues that would go on, shut down. So we're, we're looking at a new strategy. We're working with the state of North Dakota to do that, along with our airport and FAA. And I think we've got a better strategy as we move forward on that. The point is, I, hand, I attached two um, waste management logs there. And so what the waste management logs show is that we, we bring into our landfill, both the solid waste landfill and inert landfill, about 100,000 tons um, um, a year. And so, and a lot of it, similar to what Altru does and similar to our shopping, this landfill truly is a regional asset. So we're taking solid waste from Northeast North Dakota and Northwest Minnesota and truly is a, is a is a regional facility that we created here in our region. And I want to note, both on the solid waste side and inert, in, in particular on the solid waste side, if you look down that waste management log, there's a lot of things we take on a day-to-day -day basis from area industries. If they didn't have a Grand Forks solid waste landfill, there would be no place for them to um, bring theirs other than to drive to Fargo or to Gwinn or, or somewhere else. We're providing a service in our industry that's unparalleled. And without this solid waste landfill being here, there'd be some really bad days for a, a lot of our commercial businesses and industries uh, throughout our community. Um, part of our landfill permit is also, uh, we have a 40% goal of recycling and diverting from our solid waste landfill. And if you look at all those tons that we accept at the landfill and what we divert, we're at about 36%. So we're, we're, we're near our goal of diverting as much as we can from our solid waste landfill. And we do that through, um, the residential and commercial recycling that we're going to talk about more so tonight. We do it through um, segregating appliances and metals. We do it through brush, leaf, and yard, yard waste. All those things that we separate out um, from, from that stream. And I think we can truly say with our, our permit, when this landfill was permitted and started operating in 2008, I think what the state of North Dakota is going to say is that we haven't skipped a beat over the last 12 years in this facility and uh, there have, have been no issues and we've really managed and led this facility quite well and I think we're all very proud of that here in the city of Grand Forks and, and the region. So some of the history of the wastewater treatment plant, Grand Forks was the first curbside um, recycling program in the state of North Dakota. That was in 1995 and you can see some of the changes we've made. We, we went to single stream from sorts, sort, sort separating um, all the recycling um, if you were here in 2012 um, to the 2014, we had a lot of discussions about where we should be going with recycling. And, and we had an old friend, Council Member Bierke, that was a skeptic of um, recycling, as you can about imagine. He led a task force along with uh, former City Council Member Kroon, and they worked and, and trying to figure out what we should do. So what we decided at that point in time, there was a push to go full in pay as you, pay as you throw, right? Where everyone would get a, a 90 gallon um, recycling can and an associated solid waste can that they would pick a 60 or a 90 and we'd be off and going with a fully automated system both on solid waste collection and, and recycling collection. Well, we stopped short of that. Um, as I recall, there was a former mayor who voted against moving forward with that full and uh, so mayor, there's the, it was a moment where Mayor Brown did not agree with what staff did, and he did uh, not vote for moving forward for whatever reason, only six members showed up. So, so what we did is we stayed with what we had. We didn't go with the fully automated system. We kept with the single stream system. We added some apartments. We added some customers along the way. We added some small businesses, but we basically kept um, kind of do as you, if you got a container, just use your own container or we'll bring a container out there. But we, we kept it simple. And because the city council at that point determined, including our Mayor Brown, determined, uh, let's not invest any further than what we did. So we took a pause, and that's how we've gotten past through the last seven years, is that we kind of kept on doing what we're doing as we move forward. We're at the point now of, you know, looking at our services uh, in Grand Forks. And right now we have single family residences. We've added several um, multifamily units over the last seven years where apartment owners have wanted to add it on. We, added, we have three drop sites, so we've added drop sites um, over the time period too to provide uh, convenience. We have, uh, as the mayor mentioned, we have the electronics event. We do spring cleanup. We do a lot of services in sanitation, and we've got a, grad, a lot of great employees that perform it, so uh, we should be very proud of them. Um, again, just some more factoids of what we do on the recycling part. Um, we've said this statistic to you before. We average about 30 to 45% of residential 
biweekly um, set out rates, okay? Um, it's better on the south end of town than it is on the north end, so, but if, if you were in uh, uh, Mr. Kavami's uh, area, he's probably closer to 45 to 50 percent set out rate. If you are maybe more on the far north end, you're probably down in that 20 to 30 percent, but I think an average we're 35 to 45 percent of set out on a monthly. And remember we're doing bi-weekly, so some people set it out once a month, some do it um, twice a month because we do it every other week. Um, we have a high use of our drop sites. Um, and so we, it's hard, and if you, especially on the 32nd site near Hugo's and where that CVS, you know, it, especially on weekends when it's really nice, it's a lot of people are using that. So even if people aren't using the, the residential curbside, a lot of other people are using the drop sites as we move forward. And again, about 2,500 tons of materials. That's stayed pretty steady um, over, the, over the years. Um, during the pandemic, um, and maybe even prior to that, um, we, we got into it with, with China and they decided we're not going to take your recyclables anymore. And so the United States, like many areas, we're trying to figure out how do we do some of this stuff domestically. So you can see um, through this, this trend line is that things really fell off the, the bottom even before the pandemic. And you can see where the red line went with mixed uh, single stream materials. And so the red line has been the average, which has been, we'll call it $85 a ton. And you can see where the line's gone. So the recycling market really follows the commodity market. So when there's a, uh, when the economy is doing well, um, these single stream recyclables pick up. And you can see where our economy is, is going to start picking up again um, as we move forward. The one area that we really have focused on is when we look at this RFP, there's probably some items that we should probably take off. Mr. Mayor, can I ask a quick clarifying? Yes. So, so this chart we're looking at, this isn't how much people are putting out at their curb. This is how much we were able to get paid for the recycling materials. Is that? No, this is what the, these are national, what, 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 oh, the, okay. what, what the market is providing on these. Very good. Thank yep. you. And you can see, if you were looking at 19 and 20, it looked like, why would we even do curbside pickup? Because there's no value. And you can see where the market has picked up nationally. And because the market has adjusted, even despite China not being in the market like they have been, uh, waste management and others where they take our, have looked at other markets where we can move forward. However, I would highlight two areas. Um, glass is still at zero. And that should be one area that, you know, I know things are less class than they have been. That's one item we probably don't need to pick up on a single stream. The other one is plastic th three through seven. And the mayor and I were talking about what, what are the different kinds of plastic. So three, three through seven are those uh, yogurt tubs or if you get margarine, uh, plastic bags. It's, it's the, really the low hanging plastic where nobody wants it and it's probably the most nuisance of all the plastics. However, we, we noted some other plastics that do have some value, in particular um, HDPE, otherwise in the one category is the milk jugs. So who knew, who knew milk jugs were worth so much on a per ton basis? So, and then you can look through aluminum, steel, uh, paper, and cardboard where there's, there's value. And you can see from January 20th to today in April, I guess last month, where they've all picked up as we move forward. So. We looked at some benchmarking of other communities, and we, we knew this even despite our 11% increase that we, we took on this year, is that we had a competitive rate. And this, this category shows that we do have a com competitive curbside rate uh, per unit, uh, comparable to other cities like Fargo, Bismarck, and Moorhead that have a similar service than, than we do. Um, Fargo and Moorhead are, are doing it as a city and then going to a drop site. Um, we have waste management who are the next vendor. They pick it up and they also drop it off and then they market it. And ours is being marketed in Minneapolis. So uh, we have similar um, service frequency. frequency. Um, the other three communities, I will say this, Fargo, Bismarck, and Moorhead, they have gone to this 90-gallon rollout cart, cart, side load cart, that we have not gone to. Um, I would suspect that'd be one area that people would pick up on the recycling if we wanted to them because it'd be more convenient and, and more uh, whatever, that it would be a better service level. But I just want to point out that, uh, and the other thing that we, should, we would probably want to put as part of the RFP is a subscription service. So Fargo, not everybody gets charged in Grand Forks, similar to Bismarck and Moorhead. You get charged that service whether you're using it or not. It's, it's you know, multiplied by the number of residential units, single family. We have like 
I think we have 13,000 plus residential units. We also have multifamily units too that are incorporated. Fall Rose is the only community of the four where you sign up for it and then you pay for it on your utility bill, but not everybody is charged that. So I know that's that came up seven years ago. I suspect there'll be a further conversation in that vein. Again, we have a lot of work to do between May and July, and that's why we formed um, this team to try to work to the end. So and we're kind of here as a kickoff. We've got a lot of work to do on finalizing um, the RFP and getting that distributed, but we're looking for some feedback. Also what we want to do, and, and that's what our, our student intern Grayson is going to work on with Greta, is that we're going to work on a, um, a survey instrument so we can survey how people think of the, of the, res of the recycling um, service that we're providing. The last time we did it was probably 10 plus years ago. And 70% of, uh, of citizens of Grand Forks um, like the service. And so we're going to do a similar survey, do some price points so you can get some idea of what people are thinking about the service, kind of what improvements they'd like to see. Try to do that so that when we come back with an RFP that'll have a, a series of different menus that you can pick off. So my really my intent is to have um, a menu of which you can pick off as part of this recycling service contract. You will also have the, uh, the thoughts and opinions of the citizens of Grand Forks and get some sense about what they like and what they don't like, or whether they think it's, this is valuable or not. And so we'll work on that from May to June. And then in July, we're going to be here presenting the budget. And you'll know that along the way. We're, we're going to have to put this, whatever we, we, the outcome is, um, the mayor presents his budget in July. We approve it in September. But we got to get going with all these, um, getting some further information so that we can have some detailed conversations with you um, moving forward. Again, so I would say uh, what we're going to consider is part of the RFP. Um, we've had a seven-year agreement. We had a five-year agreement that we, we extended it a couple of years. One of the discussions is should we provide carts to single-family uh, residents? The one idea we came up with working with Burns and McDonald is there are some grants for external funding that um, you can get um, organizations to pay for carts, and that was not available, you know, seven, eight years ago. So that's an opportunity we're going to we're going to explore as part of this, of whether that we can make that happen. And they've done some reach out, and they are actually interested in, in supporting us on that uh, collection of the full suite of commingled materials. I think commingled recycling, single source, is really the best way to do it. That's what everyone's doing. Um, but we should probably edit out um, some of the materials that we're collecting. And at the very least, what we'll do is um, bid it so that uh, with a price with it and without it. And so we can pick off a, a menu of events. Subscription service, I know there's been some interest in, in I think uh, Council Member Weigel, I recall you being for subscription service. You didn't win out last time, but we would, as part of the RFP, include it, at, include it as everyone's all in on it and then a subscription service of what that cost would be. We'd probably have to give the, the vendors that are going to bid this some estimate of what we think would be the subscription service so they can put a dollar amount to it, but we probably to, to do that. You approved the Grand Forks Air Force Base and uh, agreement tonight, and really that what, what that is a kind of an annual agreement. We're going to pick up their, starting in July, some of their commercial solid waste with our trucks, and then they have drop sites. They have one main drop site and a few other drop sites. So what they want to be, they want to include their drop sites, their commercial drop sites for recycling in our agreement so they can get a price. Their base housing, is done is privatized both the housing and all the services so we don't worry about that that agreement that we talked about with the air force space is just on the commercial side so with that we have a lot of work to do we're going to put together an rfp it's going to have a, a menu of options we're going to be soliciting the public opinion and importantly recycling and diverting is all part of our integrated waste management plan it plays into our landfill plays into our inert landfill plays into all of our permits and just what we do day to day and uh, we'll be back here over the next few months with more and more information. But um, we want to give you a survey so we didn't get too far out in front of us. And the mayor and you as Senate Council started asking questions, what the heck are we doing? So we got a lot of work to do. So Mayor, I'll pass it back to you. Thank you, Mr. Phelan. And I do think beyond the prices, there is obviously other benefits to recycling. But an important note, if you see glass at $0, that probably means it's not ending up getting recycled. It's probably ending up in the landfill, and same with those plastics. So that's something to keep in mind, and the subscription model as well might be something that's very attractive. So any other questions or comments for Mr. Phelan? Ms. Mock. Um, when you do it, Mr. Phelan, will you take into, so you mentioned having some different options and price points. Will you take into account if 
we didn't have, say, curbside pickup, but had to increase the number of drop sites, how much that would cost? Because I know those are extremely hard to site, um, you know, both with public and um, cost of land and things like that. So will you build those into the different options? We will. There's an operational cost, but there's also a construction cost. And then finally, um, trying to get people willing to site them. And I'm really thankful, one's at Public Works facility, uh, one's at the uh, 47th Avenue South, um, I forget the name. Valley yes. Dairy. Thank you, Valley Dairy, and then obviously the Hugo CVS site. So we're really thankful for those two private sector companies allowing us to be in there. It's just hard to site, site these things, and, and they need to get bigger and bigger. It's like the Yardway site. Um, everyone wants them near them, but don't put it new, too near me. It's hard to find that location. We will do that. Mr. Weber. Sorry, Mr. Ray. I think I do. Uh, uh, the 100 year plan for the landfill, it's it, the, the recycling at, at around 35% is an important part of that projection, isn't it? It recycling is. Recycling isn't something that we can just give or take, and, and it doesn't have impact. It has, it has this impact, is that yeah. right? I think it's true if you take the whole diversion, what we're doing. Um, the, the critic would say, well, of that 35%, only 5% of that is recycling. So recycling from the curbside and even the drop sites is only 5% of that 35 The other stuff we're doing is we're getting more bang for our buck um, from landfill capacity, but it, it's providing an incremental amount. Thanks. Anything else for Mr. Phelan on this item? All right, thank you. Thank you. Legislative committee update. <laughs> Sorry. Did you Sorry. Just walk back on purpose? Uh, <laughs> don't mean to be a bollock. So um, we ended the session. Um, mm -hmm. Thank you, uh, Mr. Weber and, and Mr. Beans on here for co-chairing along with Mayor Bachensky for really stepping up. It always helps staff a lot when we have our political leadership all engaged. Um, we're going to work over the next two weeks and get the details of what the uh, the legislature passed actually and, and how it impacted our specific agenda. We don't have all those details yet. A lot of them are embedded in large appropriations bills, and we'll have to do some research on, you know, if and where our projects are and, and what opportunities we have now to go get some of the investments that we wanted to get. And that was kind of really highlighted by that 42nd and Demers um, project and other projects. So more to come. We don't know the details, but we'll be hopefully be back here in two weeks with more details. Thank you. I think we can all give a, a lot of thanks and gratitude to uh, Mr. Bernstrom, too, for all his yes. work and putting that together. He worked hard. Anybody... Uh, keeping an eye on things so thank you john anything else on that front yeah we can see him back there in the window perfect all right thank you covid19 update all right miss swanson's going to take it over i got just a quick quick couple of things obviously the vaccine uh, rollout uh, has gone well but of course it's starting to slow the uptake um, so i think it's it's really uh Combating vaccine hesitancy with vaccine convenience is the really the, the battle right now. And in the gist of that, um, I wanted to announce there's going to be a downtown vaccination day on Thursday, May 6th. Um, a lot of the downtown uh, establishments, bars and restaurants generally have partnered together. Um, you've got Bonzers, Urban Stampede, Level 10, Rhombus Guys, Brick and Barley, Rhombus Guys, Half Brothers, O'Reilly's, and Ellie's Ivy. So Thursday, May 6th from 3 to 8 at the Empire, um, you can go down, get vaccinated. There'll be live entertainment while you're waiting for those 15 minutes. And uh, it's just walk in. Uh, they'll have Pfizer and J&J &J available. And the, the cool thing is you get a free coupon for a beverage at one of these places. So adult or otherwise, you'll have options there. Um, but it's just kind of a neat, uh, neat way to incentivize people if they're already downtown or a reason to go there. And there's, uh, there's never, you never need a reason to go to the Empire. So that's a, a great feature as part of it. So more to come on that uh, look at the posts uh, on social media and other places on that uh, event miss swanson please good evening mayor bochensky and members of the city council present and those that are joining us virtually i'm debbie swanson director of gunfox public health department and i fully recognize i'm standing between you and the end of the meeting and dinner so i will be brief this evening <laughs> Um, normally, uh, you have Michael Doolitz here, and I am not the data um, expert that Mr. Doolitz and Narice um, Nicolette are, but I will provide you with a really brief update, and I'm going to focus on a lot of the positive news tonight, uh, much of which is 
surrounding vaccinations. The event that Mayor Bochensky just mentioned is by one of our uh, community partners, All True Health Systems, is uh, going to be doing the vaccinating at the Empire, and we are focusing some of our efforts in some other pop-up type events that you'll hear more about later. But uh, the dashboard shows that we are in the yellow, which I think people are accustomed to these colors, and we've been there for 20 days now. Um, you may notice that you won't be getting an update from me uh, daily as you used to with just the data report from the State Health Department. They have ceased to do that on a daily basis, but the dashboard provides you with very similar information. Um, so if you wish to receive it in a different format, please let us know. Uh, this is just the case rate. You can see where we want to be is green. We want to be in the green, and um, we can see that the most new, most of our new cases now, the seven-day averages, are occurring in the younger age groups, the 10 to 19, 20 to 29, 30 to 39. So we have some work to do on vaccinations where we can. And then this is just our vaccination rate according to that um, dashboard and how we want to be at 60%, which is just our number that we've chosen for herd immunity. If you've seen the New York Times today, you know there's an article about herd immunity and whether or not we'll get there and um, what we might be facing in the future. Um, we are in for a very long effort as we move forward with vaccinations now. And what we hope to do is turn more of these people on this graph that are currently yellow and red into green. That means they'll be fully vaccinated, and that's uh, the individuals uh, that are um, needed to re reach the 60% um, herd immunity. But if we go to younger age groups, that increases our denominator, so we'll be back to needing to vaccinate more individuals. Uh, this is our 14-day average of first doses. As you can see, we had a really strong peak the end of March, beginning of April, but now that has started to decrease. We're continuing to offer second doses, and once again, those outreach efforts will help us to increase our first dose opportunities. Uh, you can see that Grand Forks is doing fairly well in our full vaccine coverage rate in our quest to 60%. Uh, we're a little bit behind Cass County, so liking healthy competition, it would be nice to see us a little bit closer to that 40%, but we're getting there. Uh, this is where Grand Forks County really shines, and that's in the area of vaccinating our most vulnerable according to age. So individuals 65 and older, we've hit the 90%, which is really phenomenal. Uh, you can see that's way above the state average and above all of the other peer counties that we're comparing ourselves to. Uh, it's 92% in those individuals that are 65 to 74. That's a group of people that are very vaccine accepting. Um, they've seen vaccine preventable diseases in their lifetime, so they value it, and there's been really strong uptake there. And then another really bright spot is the percent vaccinated among those children that are 16 to 17 years old. Remember, they can receive the Pfizer vaccine. Uh, that's the only vaccine that right now is approved for that age group. And we are really doing a phenomenal job at 37%. And this is before a really robust effort to find those children. Uh, many of them have attended our events along with their parents. And just now, that's starting to be um, utilized more in pediatric offices and family practice offices, and I expect that number to increase as children uh, have back to school physicals and sports physicals and um, school programs are, school, school vaccination programs are more common. So our bottom line, uh, our strengths, as I've already mentioned, the one dose vaccination rate at 90% in that 65 and older group, and then the 16 to 17 year old population being already strong, even though that has, hasn't been a huge part of our focus. And then the overall decrease in our cases and hospitalizations especially have really, really decreased. We're seeing in the single digit numbers and hospitalizations. They do tend to be in a younger age group, um, but the numbers are very low. And then our seven-day uh, sum uh, has gone as low as 79 cases from a recent peak of 134. Uh, we still need to work on those uh, case incidents in the younger groups, ages 10 to 39. And especially in the like 19 or 20 to 39 age group, those are working adults, and so reaching them in workplaces will be our challenge and uh, certainly an opportunity as well. 
Uh, we are seeing a slowing of the vaccination rate. I think I've already covered that. But that's also an opportunity to improve the uptake in the 16 to 50, excuse me, 16 to 64 age population. Um, and then our threats. Uh, it's hard to end on a, a negative note like this, but the vaccine hesitant populations um, are susceptible to vaccine misinformation. We're starting to see a little bit more of that in our community through social media, but all th also through some direct outreach. So uh, the health department and our partners are working to increase social media presence around where to get accurate information so that the misinformation doesn't take over and further hamper our efforts. And then COVID-19 case incidents in school-aged children who are not eligible for vac vaccination is a bit of a threat. Uh, those children generally do well and recover fine, but there is a small percentage of them that can get serious illness. And indeed, 300 children have died from COVID over the last uh, 14 months. And that's about double what we see in a, in an influ in a bad influenza season. So it really has um, some impact. There are some vaccine manufacturers that are testing their products in children ages 12 to 15, and we expect that that will be an emergency use authorization vaccine fairly soon. So once again, another opportunity. And I think that concludes my remarks, unless there's any questions from council members or Mayor Bochanski. Any questions from Ms. Swanson or comments? All right. Well, thank you as usual. Much appreciated. All right. Now we're going to move on to five information items. Investment portfolio summary as of March 31st. Thank you. Statement of changes of cash balance as of February 28th. Thank you. All right, six citizen comments. We'll open it up. Is there any citizen comments tonight? All right, citizen comments closed. Seven, approval of minutes and bills. Vendor list and engineering's estimate as presented. Do we have a motion to approve the, we got a motion from, for approval from Mr. Kavami, second from Mr. Weigel. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Both same sign. The vendor list and engineer's estimate is approved. Minutes from February 16th. We have a motion to accept the minutes. I think that's our All right. Mr. Weber read them from front to back, and he has approved them. We have a second. All right. Ms. Mock seconds. Those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. The minutes are approved. Mr. Phelan, have you had enough? We got city administrator comments no. number eight. You've had enough of me. Thank you for your attention. All right, Mayor and Council Member comments. Number nine, let's start with uh, Mr. Weigel. I'll pass, Mayor. All right, Ms. Dockler, or she might have stepped out. Mr. Uh, Weber. No, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Ms. Mock. Okay, thank you. This is going well. Mr. Kavami. All right, Mr. Sandy and Mr. Veen did have to step away, and I'm not going to break uh, this hot streak, so I won't have any comments tonight. So we'll move on to 10. Can I get a motion to adjourn? Mr. Weber, motions. Second from Mr. Weigel. Those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. I think that's everyone. We are adjourned.